And um, to my left is Kenan Wasame, who is from Somalia and has a very good understanding of Al-Shabaab and will speak a little bit about the birth of Shabaab, which I think is important to understand and give this piece context. And, um, and next to him, Julieta Lozano, who is Assistant District Attorney for Manhattan, and she has just handled a, um, just recently, a very um, big investigation uh, dealing with ivory dealers, and she will talk about that prosecution as well as her investigators and an extremely important um, lieutenant that she worked with and her need for more investigators and how critical this, this problem is, even for New York City, which I think is going to be kind of enlightening to many people, certainly was to me. To her left is Peter Godwin, a documentary filmmaker, novelist, screenwriter, uh, grew up in, or actually was raised in um, Zimbabwe and was uh, a human rights lawyer for many years until he um, transitioned here. And he's uh, very versed in terrorism and, and um, the militias that are on the rise across Africa. And he'll speak about that. And then Peter Knights, who is the director of WildAid.org, who was one of the initiators of this piece, and he'll speak about the initiatives that they have um, and ones they've been incredibly successful with for shark fin soup, and they're especially in China, predominantly in China, obviously. And um, and his his uh, you know what his organization is doing to try to lower the demand for ivory in Asia and across around the world as well. So he'll speak about that, which will be a wonderful kind of um, overview, I think, for everybody. So um, how this came about, I've been um, an animal advocate, I, I would say, as long as I can remember. And um, about a year ago, I had the uh, fortune of meeting both Hillary and Chelsea Clinton. Chelsea had just come back from sub-Saharan Africa with her father and had uh, just at the time when poachers had put cyanide in an elephant watering hole and I mean there were herds and herds that had been slaughtered as a result of it and um, and I was very moved and decided that I needed to do something about this and uh, to the extent that I could, whatever I could, I could sort of enter this enter this world, try to create a dialogue, try to raise awareness in whatever way that might be potentially meaningful, and um, and then I had a conversation with Peter Knights uh, from Wild Aid, and we talked about the, you know, the various avenues, various, you know, a lot of research, basically, was um, was kind of where I was at the, at the time, and trying to kind of um, come up to speed, come up, could never come up to his speed, but come up to speed as quickly as I could, because the urgency was so great. And time is of the essence, and we are running out of time, certainly as we speak right now. And um, and then at that point, I made the connection between terrorism, uh, which was just beginning to be reported about the Westgate Mall and poaching, and that was how Al Shabaab was financing, to a certain extent or to a large extent, a lot of their nefarious act activities. And so, once I made that connection, I realized that would be an interesting. Um, opportunity to connect the dots, and I chose to do it as a PSA because time is of the essence. I mean, a feature would be wonderful, but um, but they're dying. I mean, we're not going to have them around, yeah, unfortunately, for much longer. And um, and so then I, I enlisted the help of Scott Burns, a great, great, great writer, and we put a treatment together, and, um, and mm. I decided to do it as a piece of animation, and that really is because it would be impossible for me to sit in the cutting room and look um, at live footage of an animal being um, suffering at all, day after day. So, um, not that it's easy to look at this necessarily, but it, it creates a kind of mediated layer, and also mm -hmm. I thought it might be a little bit more accessible, and therefore perhaps reach a larger audience. And, um, and then uh, I found, knowing nothing about animation, I found an extraordinary um, an expert in this field, and that's Sandy Ravens, and 
she kind of walked me through all the steps, and, and uh, I'm very conversant with live action, not conversant with, with animation. It was a great kind of learning curve. And she introduced me to Sam uh, Mishlap, who is the predominant artist here, who really created this whole look. And, um, and I sort of nicknamed him the Goya of the uh, animation world. I don't know if you're familiar with Goya's Disasters of War, but I would call this Sam Mishlap's Disasters of the Elephant Poaching Crisis. And, um, and then the wonderful uh, Paul Otteson, who was the sound designer on Her Locker and Zero Dark Thirty, and he agreed to help us out with sound. Now, this has been a labor of love, and, um, you know, people were, uh, you know, I would get these drawings at 3 o'clock in the morning because everybody had day jobs, of course, and, you know, Paul Otteson, I'd be working around all these giant movies that he's mixing, and, you know, I'd come over to the stage at, like, you know, 10 at night, and we'd be doing some sound mixing. But I also have to say that none of this would have been possible without the incredible and courageous support of my producing partner and collaborator, Annapurna Pictures, Megan Ellison. So I just want to say a great, I'm indebted to her. Sure. So just to start things off and talk a little bit about the birth of Shabab and, and you know, whatever uh, you think might be helpful to understand the context of this, I'd love to turn it over to you. Sure. Um, well, you know, I'm born in Mogadishu, Somalia, and um, I'm a musician and a writer and a few other things. And um, I grew up partly in, in in that city that you all know only from probably mostly from news and uh, and all of that. But I grew up there. I was I was there till I was 14, and then left to to this part of the world, New York, and so on. Um, just want to give you context of like Somalia is, is considered a, f a failed state they say and it's a it's a country that hasn't had a centralized government for maybe the last 20 some odd years so you know you can imagine it, it's like this this city for example without any police or ambulance system or uh, you know so that's kind of what uh, Somalia has been for a long time and so you've got all these young people who have no uh, no uh, education, no um, uh, any prospects in, in life, no not, nothing, no net to cast, the, the, you know, for the future, and so um, that's largely the state of the country. And in in around 2005, there was a um, a group called the Islamic Courts Union, which came into into power. Now, this group comes out of a bunch of uh, uh, basically businesses and uh, different people in the community who wanted to figure out a way when we don't have a centralized government, how do we manage? How do we manage these streets? How do women walk in, at night without being raped? How do businesses survive without being? under the weapon of extortion constantly. And so a bunch of businesses and kind of elders and local leaders got together and they forged a sort of a semi-government um, called the Islamic Courts Union. In this part of the world, that's an unfortunate name to have. But, but back, back home, the Islamic Courts Union is not necessarily that Islamic. They, they, because the country is Muslim, um, the, the, it, it's a, it creates a banner under which everyone can say, I identify mm -hmm. with this. You know, it's like calling something the American society of something. Um, and so then you don't have the, the Latino saying, well, you, you don't have the black saying. You've got that banner. And that to us is um, the way Islam is seen in, in, in kind of uh, certain countries. I mean, of course, there is people's religion and some, you know, People practice, some of them do, some of them don't. Uh, but, but under that, it's a national identity, and so they called it the Islamic Courts Union. I, I should let you know that we don't have a, a system of law like you guys have. And actually, I think ours suits us better than yours suits us, because the system of, of Somali law is based on customary law, um, which, which basically means that 
all observed behaviors, norms of society, is the only articles of law which can be introduced uh, to the to 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 uh, the community. So there there will be there's no laws in Somali which can be introduced by a politician or a religious figure. Um, all law comes from behavior behavioral norms of the people, uh, which really works for the Somali. So that's actually what the Islamic Courts Union was administering. Um, in them, you have different ideologies. You have people who want to be more Islamic than, uh, you know, who want to have a staunch concept of the religion, you know, the people who believe in Sharia and uh, people who believe in the cultural norms. So you have that kind of battle always going on in them. In 2005, that group secured the country and uh, um, they, they took hold of this nation that for 20 years had, has had no central government and they made Somalia livable, incredibly livable. So much so that a, a, large, a large part of the diaspora was beginning to return to Somalia. This is 2005. Myself included, I had plans to go back home. Uh, I, I have at that, in that time become a, a musician that was recognized at home. And so, you know, it was a big thing for me to return. Uh, but what happened was the United States got wind of uh, what this Islamic Courts Union is doing. Um, and it didn't seem like a good idea to the, 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 the policymakers in this country foreign policy maker. And they uh, basically started to figure out covert and overt operations as to how to destabilize this group that's calling themselves. George Bush at the time thought, Islamic Courts Union, that sounds like my nightmare. Uh, so we must end this. And so they, they uh, so what happened, a long story short, uh, um, the, the, you know, the, Ethiopia came in, America came in, they destabilized that, that the, the little bit of peace that we had, the little bit of stability that we had, and we have Al-Shabaab that came out of the vacuum, out of the void of a total hopelessness and, 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 and loss uh, to this country. I just wanted to give you context so that you understand when we're watching uh, this very prominent group in, in the video, in, the, in this uh, amazing film, uh, Al-Shabaab, they're not born out of the, the, uh, the generally uh, kind of imagined African con uh, incompetence and, and insanity, the madness of these people we don't understand. They come from a very particular uh, failure, uh, one which we have a, a large hand in. And so when, when you watch this video, I, I wanted you to have a kind of not know that you, you can be a part of the solution, but you also kind of are a part of the problem, and therefore you, it's a kind of a responsibility of yours. Um, that's, that's all I wanted to do is give you a little bit of context. Thanks. That's beautiful. Yeah. Juliana. Can you all hear me without the microphone? Okay. No. <laughs> okay. Um, to follow up on uh, all of our respective responsibilities as um, faulting, you know, the faults that we um, have, as well as the responsibilities, I wanted to talk about um, my experiences prosecuting environmental crimes, including. Um, the sale of ivory uh, and other illegal wildlife <coughs> items in New York City uh, and in New York State. Uh, it may surprise many of you to know that uh, in the Diamond District, ivory is for sale. Mm. Uh, not legally, it's um, in uh, this country we have kind of a, a differing layers of laws that uh, protect wildlife and that make the sale of ivory illegal. And on the large level, you have the, the federal laws um, that apply to people who are bringing in ivory or exporting ivory or selling it across state lines. You also have international treaties 
uh, of which the United States is a party, regarding which countries are allowed to export ivory, you know, ivory producing countries, and which are not, and the United States as a party to um, those treaties uh, agrees not to allow the import from prohibited countries. Then you have each state has its own ability to regulate the sale of wildlife, including ivory. New York State has jurisdiction, um, and I'm, I'm a prosecutor in Manhattan, so I follow New York State laws. That's, that's the kind of law that I prosecute. Uh, and what those laws prohibit uh, is basically the sale, the commercialization, uh, which is broadly defined not just as a sale, but any offer for sale. So if you have an item with a price tag on it in a shop, you're commercializing. Um, and within, you know, within the, uh, the boundaries of New York State. So uh, I started this kind of work. I started, I've been a prosecutor for uh, approximately 16 years. Um, and in uh, 2000, approximately, I began uh, looking into and prosecute environmental crimes work. And uh, that, uh, for those of you uh, not particularly familiar with law and order, uh, there are two sides <laughs> of enforcement, and there are lawyers who do what I do, uh, and you, you, you file motions, you, um, you file accusatory instruments, you indict people, but in order to get to that point, you need the investigators, the police officers, the people who go in and uh, do the undercover work and buy the ivory, who follow targets around, who um, figure out who's getting money from whom for certain sales. And in New York, primarily the agency that I work with um, and have worked with uh, since 2000 is the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. They are the experts on the wildlife trade and, and on environmental law in general. So they do asbestos and hazardous waste and wildlife is just one of their areas of expertise. We often, when I work with them, we often work with the federal government as well, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, because as you can imagine, when we have people in Manhattan um, shops selling ivory, they didn't get it here because there are no elephants here. So <laughs> somebody's bringing it in. So we need to have that connection. Um, there, uh, Manhattan um, is, uh, by all accounts, the second largest market for ivory, uh, which is very surprising to people. But if you really think about it, uh, New York is uh, the crossroads uh, for many people, it's a huge uh, uh, business center for all kinds of products, and ivory happens to be one of them. Uh, we also have ports here. So we have airports, we have um, ways to get in um, through uh, ocean carriers. Uh, so New York is a pl you know, place where we find um, the majority of ivory in, in the United States being sold. Uh, so I started um, these cases back in 2000, and it was shocking to me how easily investigators could go in and find ivory for sale. In New York, uh, you are not allowed to sell unless, and I'll explain this a little more when we talk about the laws, you're not allowed to sell ivory or offer it for sale unless you have a permit given under very restrictive um, conditions. Um, so antiques, for instance, musical instruments, uh, not little trinkets, not little carved items. Um, and it was incredibly easy to go in and make these purchases and prosecute these folks. Um, so easy that uh, we realized uh, this is a huge problem. This isn't just one or two shops. In, I believe it was in 2006, there was um, some sort of uh, research done, study by a, um, a not-for-profit 
uh, group who went to shops in New York City and found uh, approximately 150 shops selling ivory without permits, not just completely illegal. Um, I had the honor um, and um, you know absolute pleasure of being trained to do this and learning my way around um, the ivory trade in New York City from uh, what uh, pretty much everyone um, in this state and outside this state would agree uh, from a person who was uh, the pr one of the preeminent experts of um, uh, the commercial ivory trade in, um, in the United States. Um, and he was a lieutenant at the Department of Environmental Conservation. His name was John Fitzpatrick. Um, and he uh, was unbelievably committed to this cause and worked tirelessly and saw the exact connections between something that sold on Madison Avenue and the fact that elephants were being slaughtered at an alarming rate. Um, and he and I, from 2000 uh, till um, last year, um, uh, worked on uh, all of the biggest ivory investigations in this city. Um, unfortunately and tragically, he died uh, in May at the age of 46. Um, and um, his, he will never be able to be replaced um, in, you know, in the work that we do, but we are continuing in his honor and, um, and with respect to the, what we did in 2000, we started cases um, that led to other cases and, and these, we started with just undercover purchases and one-off prosecutions of small shops. And then we realized that we had to work up and see where were these people getting all of these items that they, that appeared to be newly made um, items. Um, so with John and with um, the Department of Environmental Conservation, we expanded our focus and in 2012, um, we uh, actually uh, investigated, it was a, an over a year long undercover investigation into multiple shops in the Diamond District uh, brazenly selling ivory. Um, the, uh, we did search warrants, we did purchases from these places. With John's expertise, we were able to, as the undercovers, I didn't, but the investigators did, identify when they looked at the items that they were in fact ivory and not plastic. We purchased and then we did search warrants, so instead of just having as evidence the one piece of ivory that we purchased, we went in and we got everything in those shops, everything. We seized approximately one ton of ivory in those shops, which uh, a rough equivalent, uh, a wildlife expert um, said, uh, was probably the remains of approximately 100 elephants. Um, and uh, the retail value was approximately $2 million. Uh, Having said that, uh, the only thing that we could charge these people with was the lowest level felony in New York State, an E felony, which is a maximum four years in jail, uh, but most likely if you don't have uh, a record, is probation. Uh, so that's what we had, uh, and that's what we did. Um, uh, and that, uh, investigation uh, was used as an example when public sentiment kind of independently um, started really, and I'm, I'm sure you all read in um, the New York Times and other press, um, there's just the drum roll of people saying this does matter and this does matter to New Yorkers and this is why it matters and pressing our legislators to do something about it. Um, I, th our, oh, 
Well, we, I think, we, but let's let's hear from Peter too. Oh, okay. I mean, well, I just wanted to say that that um, I think we should come back to Julietta. We'll take uh, questions from the audience, but I think the idea that um, you know that what is sadly fueling this slaughter uh, are these militias across Africa that are realizing that these elephants are um, basically you know ATM machines for them and. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we're now witnessing industrialized slaughter. So what Julietta is saying is all this, you know, the, the trinkets that are making their way here um, in greater and greater and greater quantities have a lot to do with the rise of the militias and, and perhaps the ease of execution, no pun intended, of these beautiful, extraordinary animals which are going to go extinct if something is not done about the demand. And once the demand is stopped and or stigmatized, then, um, then the ivory becomes valueless. So that would be, of course, my goal. And Peter, I think if you could talk a bit about the economics of this. Sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm prone to stage fright, so I'm going to, I'm going to have some notes. But I will promise to look as though I'm ad-libbing. Um, uh, the, the firm aluminium, um, or alumina, as I'm, aluminum, as I understand it's called, um, stroller or walker of notes, I'm afraid. My name is as, um, Peter Godwin, in case you've already forgotten. Um, and I was oddly uh, born and raised in Africa on the Mozambique border of what is now Zimbabwe. The Afrikaners further south had a disparaging name for us English-speaking white Africans. They called us soap peel. In Afrikaans, this means salt penis. <laughs> they said we had one foot in Africa and one in Europe, so our genitals marinated in the ocean. <laughs> Back then, wildlife was plentiful. People were few. When I started writing about poaching in the 1980s as the correspondent for the London Times in Africa. It was a story that revolved around the human communities that lived among elephants. In truth, odd as it may sound, conservation is really all about people, not about animals. In those days, conservation was bound up in land usage, in scarce resources, in poverty. How could conservationists who tended to be white people from the north tell Africans how to use their land, especially when these northern folk had long since gotten rid of the bulk of their own larger wildlife, bears, wolves, bison. In some quarters, conservation was even seen as the last kick of a colonial horse. Wildlife conservation, we argued then, would succeed or fail for economic rather than aesthetic reasons alone. We tend to think of elephants in particular as living in game reserves, in national parks, largely segregated from humans. But until recently, 80% of elephants lived outside parks, among local communities, just as they had for thousands of years. Only, of course, the number of humans ballooned, and so the two species were pushed together as never before, and they came into conflict for resources. To us, then, then, the key was to involve those local communities front and center in conservation, to give them a major stake in the survival of elephants and other high-impact animals. Not just around the edges, selling souvenirs to tourists, or dancing for them, or serving as staff in high-end lodges, but in the ownership and income of the safari and tourism businesses themselves. It was not enough to anthropomorphize animals especially those who tend, we tend to admire most, the so-called charismatic megafauna, of which the elephant is the apex animal. <clears throat> if the local communities were empowered in this way, we believed, they would provide the main level of protection for these endangered species. But the story has changed since then, especially in East and Central Africa, which has seen the most devastatingly precipitous collapse of elephant numbers. Poaching has now become industrialized and militarized. Mm. The Janjaweed militia in Sudan, the Lord's Resistance Army in northern Uganda, Al-Qaeda offshoots in Kenya and Tanzania, there's increasing evidence that all get significant funding from ivory poaching. And as we've heard, 
Al-Shabaab in Somalia. Recent investigations of Al-Shabaab estimate that as much as half their funds now come from ivory poaching. I was in Nairobi attending the Hayes Story Mojo Literary Festival when the Westgate Mall was attacked almost exactly a year ago. One of our writers, the wonderful Ghanaian poet Kofi Awuna, met his death there. Ivory is the perfect resource for a well-armed terrorist group. Such groups are now equipped with night vision goggles, with satellite phones, with machine guns. They have 4 by 4 vehicles and even small planes. Often, often <clears throat> they are up against poorly armed, poorly paid and poorly trained wildlife rangers. Poaching has, in effect, become an extension of war in a huge swathe of territory from Somalia to Kenya to northern Uganda, Chad, Congo, and the Central African Republic. And the clock is running down fast. Elephants make a ludicrously easy target. They're easy to find, easy to stalk, huge in size, and highly communal in their behavior. With such sophisticated relationships and such loyalty to one another that if you identify and kill the elephant matriarch first, the others will often mill around, loath to abandon her, trying to help her up, even as they become targets to high-caliber machine gun fire themselves. Now, industrial-scale poaching is reaching further south into the traditionally more secure herds. In southern Tanzania, the vast Salu National Park, twice the size of Switzerland, was home to 110,000 elephant back in 1976. Today, there are about 13,000, one, three, 13,000 left. In the last five years alone, it's lost nearly three quarters of its elephant population. And just over its border in northern Mozambique, the elephants in Nyasa National Park are under assault like never before, their numbers halving in the last five years. With the soaring prices of ivory and the new wealth in the client countries, China in particular, the core elephant populations in Zambia, Botswana, and South Africa are now coming under pressure. In my own shattered country of Zimbabwe, poachers have recently started using an appalling new tactic in the dry season when elephants must, must converge daily on smaller and smaller water holes. The poachers have been lacing these with arsenic. Mm. Dozens of elephants have met excruciating deaths in this manner. Kruger National Park in South Africa the oldest wild, wildlife park on the continent, once considered impregnable, is now unable to protect its rhino population. More than 600 rhino were poached last year, and this year it's already approaching 500. And it's also seeing an uptick in elephant poaching there. We are no longer on a gentle downward slope here. We are rushing towards the end game of an extraordinary beast, the largest living terrestrial animal, Loxodonta africana, the African elephant. I hope that we will not be the generation that allowed this to happen. Thank you. Um, I was very excited when Catherine started to talk to me about this project because, uh, as we've just heard, uh, for me, this is a moment where the world can slightly recontext the whole ivory issue, that it's not just about animals dying, it's not just about extinction, it's about human beings and human suffering too. And I think uh, the, the analogy I like to look at is this might be the, the blood ivory moment. We had the blood diamonds, exactly the same phenomenon. It's something being used as a financing mechanism, as a currency, and if anything, uh, elephants are even more vulnerable than diamonds. You know, they, it's very easy to find, it's very easy to sell it. I originally was an economist. Um, running a wildlife organization is not the normal career track for an economist. But the thing that I saw, which perhaps nobody had seen up to that time, was conservation was taking a, a predominantly supply-side effort. All the energy was going into trying to protect the supply of animals. And it wasn't working at various times. And I looked into why it wasn't working. Every time we've had these poaching crises, and we've had them periodically, it always corresponds to fast economic growth in the consuming countries. So when there was the Saudi oil boom, the Yemeni rhino horn dagger handle market exploded, and we had a huge rhino poaching crisis. Um, now, more latterly, it's the Chinese economic growth, which has been phenomenal, and it's something which has brought millions of people out of poverty. 
the downside is there's been uh, this new money which has been looking for a place to go and it's looked for prestige items, um, uh, silly items in some cases, things like rhino horn, sim things like ivory, things like shark fin soup. Shark fin soup has no flavor. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's just basically the texture of the whole thing, but it's seen as being a prestige, prestigious item. And now, Huawei's unique insight um, was that nothing would change unless you impacted the demand, and that we'd been kind of banging on at the wrong end for too long. We were never going to get enough resources to protect the animals in Africa. We can't do that with the drugs trade. We can't stop the drugs trade with trillions of dollars going into interdiction and supply side attempts. Be why has it not succeeded? Because we haven't addressed the demand. Now, the big difference with wildlife is it's not associated, wildlife consumption is not associated with poverty or despair or addiction. Quite the opposite. It, it's associated with wealth and affluence and ostentatious behavior. So it seemed to me the key was to make that consumption socially unacceptable in those countries. So back in 1996, and at that time, the key countries that were problematic were not China, because there was no money in China. It was Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. So they all had to follow the money. That is the key. Um, those places were the big markets. We worked with Jackie Chan, a whole host of stars. And it's interesting that now, for example, on Rhino Horn, Taiwan is never cited as a problem. It was the number one problem in 1993. So we can affect these social changes through massive public awareness uh, and through legal, le legal issues like bans. That's also a great way of, of promulgating public awareness. But the ban in itself, to me, is only the start. It's the public awareness generated. It really makes the law effective. Laws are only effective if they have broad public support and buy-in. And so that's a, a sort of outreach and an education process. And what we've managed to do is recruit now over 100 different celebrities in Asia, from Jackie Chan to Yao Ming to um, Olympic athletes to uh, business leaders, all to support this cause. And my original job was as an undercover investigator. And I was going to Africa looking at the poaching. I was going to Asia looking at the smuggling. And what I found with people buying these products is very often, even the selling, people selling the products in uh, places like Taiwan were completely unaware of the chain that they were involved in. All they knew is this product arrived. Some of them didn't even know what a rhino looked like. And so there was a huge disconnect between the market. And then people would say, well, you know, the elephants died. We're just recycling the ivory. Or the rhino died and, you know, it's just recycling it. It's like, well, no, you know, there's 24-7 protection. These animals are being poached. Um, rangers are dying. Poachers are dying. They didn't appreciate that. So it's a massive education that's needed. And you can educate people um, through information. You can educate them through the news. Or you can educate them by trying to inspire and bring them in. And what I love about this piece is not only the, it's a horrific story, but the beauty of the animation, um, the incredible sound effects that are in there. You get sucked into the story. It's not just someone lecturing you about the problem. You get sucked in. And I think that's the key, because these things don't happen overnight. They do take time. Anybody can get a headline once, and then everyone thinks, oh, well, that problem's solved. The key is to keep this out there over time until it really, really is solved. And pieces like this enable this story to have longer life. They bring in a different element. They make people think in a different way. Some people reject ivory because of the cruelty to elephants. Some people reject it because they, uh, you know, the, they're worried about the extinction of elephants. Others will just think about the human side of things that it's not just that there's the terrorism involved, that people are dying, economies are being damaged in Africa, people are losing their jobs, people are losing their education. I asked one, uh, one gentleman in, in uh, Kenya, what did he, when he saw a poached elephant, how did he feel? And he said, I feel that's 200 children that haven't been educated in our village, because the money from conservation was going to that. So we have to tell these broader stories, and it's not going to be one magic bullet that kills the demand for ivory. It'll be a combination of things until we reach a tipping point. We, the good news is we reached a tipping point in 1989. And in 1989, there was an international ban on ivory trade. And basically, the markets of most of the world collapsed. That was a long time ago now, and people have maybe forgotten. You know, the images that went out around that ban, the world basically closed the thing down. There are new consumers in China that weren't in the ivory market at that time. Now they are. So we need to do that whole effort again. But I believe we can do this. Um, the biggest single thing that can be done to save the elephant is for China to ban the legal sales of ivory that currently go on. The history of the ivory trade is that legal mechanisms, as we've heard, enable people to launder illegal ivory through the system. You have the, the ostensibly legal and ostensibly legitimate side, and all the poached ivory is going through those channels. And so we have to close that down. The way we're going to do that, you can't kind of lobby in the same way in China as you can in the United States, uh, but you can influence people through public opinion <coughs> and, and through understanding. And so our big desire is this film is going to get far and wide 
in China. We've already talked to some of the biggest internet companies over there. We have partnerships with groups like CCTV, the, the state-run TV industry. Last year we had $170 million of media space donated in China, mostly by public media. So people in China do care when they have the information, but we have to get them the information. And one of the best ways of conveying information is in a dramatic way like this that has a huge emotional pull. I have to tell some of my colleagues, it's not about the facts, it's about the emotion. You know, people, people change their behavior for the emotion, they then rationalize it with the facts. And I think what's fantastic about this piece is the emotional pull to it, the intensity of it, and it's an amazing mm. piece of work, and we're very proud to be associated with it. Thank you. On that note, thank you very much. I think we should take, we don't, we don't have much time, and I'd like to take a few questions from the audience, just to see what, what any of you are thinking. Yeah. How much of the ivory purchase in the U.S. do you think is destined for other countries, and what is it that individuals do? Repeat the question. The, the question was how much of the oh, how much of the ivory uh, sold in the United States uh, is destined for international markets, and what we can do here in order to stop that from happening, uh, and. Uh, I can tell you from just the experience of our cases um, that a considerable amount of the ivory that um, we seized and the records that we seized uh, indicated that the ivory was either being sent to um, China, was a big market, Europe, South America. Um, and I think uh, I, I would follow up with what uh, Peter just said. Um, you're going to pull people in with emotion. And I think that here we should also ban and have no exemptions around um, permitting and selling ivory. It should just be banned. You cannot do it. But in order to get to that point, um, and in order to have legislators buy into that, you need to have the public feel that that is a priority and that is what they want to happen and they will lobby their legislators to change that law. Um, you know, you can have you, you can have many conversations where people um, talk about the laws and use words to describe what is happening in Africa, but with a film like this, um, there's really no there's no other conclusion you can reach than it must be banned, not just for the elephants, but because terrorist groups that, even if you don't care about elephants, because maybe there are legislators who don't care, people who don't care, but they care about terrorism. And I think linking those two things and using that um, to make, uh, to, to lobby for a ban is what we can do and one of the brilliant um, things of this film. Who else? Just curious, what what exactly are people buying other than 57th Street trying to cheat people and sell plastic trinkets uh, that are known to be ivory, which are an ivory, which is a very big store, which never closes, but yeah. what what is it? What is it? Um, what it, are they buying? It, it runs the gamut. Um, there are lots of. Uh, very cheap, low-level, uh, literally trinkets, little carved items, flowers, <coughs> ironically, little elephants, little animals. There are also the uh, newly made, not the antique, uh, Natsuke uh, items, uh, uh, you know, the, the Japanese Natsuke. But then there are also uh, puzzle boxes um, that are uh, intricately carved boxes within a box. We have found tusks um, that are carved with you know, pastoral scenes. Uh, so it really runs the gamut. Yeah. Yes. I was wondering about the culture in Africa, about the relationship of the African population to the elephant, and what work is being done there, <clears throat> not political work, but to uh, have the people that live there protect the elephants also. Uh, the, 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 when you talked about the United States' role in your country, 
um, that was a big red flag to me about how this cannot be seen as a Western or European or American project to save the elephant. So I'd like, I, perhaps you could speak about what on the ground culture there. Sure, I'll do a little shameless plug here. On November the 18th, Animal Planet is doing a show with Yao Ming, the basketball player, the most popular person, people in China. We took him to Africa, we went to villages, just like you're talking about. And what we were told there by the people is that, you know, they, they depend on direct revenues from the tourism industry to fund their schools and their health care. And so I think it was very good what Peter said there. There was a point in time previously in Southern Africa where people were saying, oh, there's conflict with elephants and there's too many of them. Now that, that's changed. You know, people are now going, hey, they may go. So there is a lot of work going on on the ground. There has been that for a, a long time. And, you know, one of the key things is just giving local communities more of a stake in tourism, making sure that tourism isn't just big West, uh, Western rich companies making the money, but the money really does trickle down. There are real good jobs for local Africans there. Um, beyond that, I think, um, my experience is that, uh, you know, people may be living in very, very simple circumstances. They may be living in, in what we would call poverty, but they get the sense that the elephant and their environment is part of their, their existence, their culture, their life. And, uh, you know, and, and when people come and see that, they'll travel all the way around the world to come and see that, they're pretty proud of it. And so I think there can be more done for local communities, but they, that's been addressed over time. One of the good things in this ivory crisis is a lot of the African governments have got a lot more serious about it now. People like President Bongo from Gabon has really got serious. The Tanzanian government and the Clintons have a lot to thank for this, getting the African leaders to say, hey, come on, you've got to get this together. And so that, that is progressing, I think, in a, in a very positive way. Um, and the big key is can we just now stop the demand, um, you know, destroying it before they're capable of building a much more long-term sustainable <coughs> life for elephants, where people and elephants coexist, where local people benefit, I think, increasingly. This is an asset which is only going to go up in value if you keep them alive. More and more people want to go. The, the cost of safaris goes up and up. This can be a major source of development if it's still there for people to have. I think we only have time for maybe two more questions. Yeah. My question is for you. Uh, if you could discuss uh, how the process evolved to retold the story backwards. Um, the gentleman is asking uh, me how the story uh, evolved in terms of telling, the, telling it backwards. And um, it really had to do a lot with not wanting to end on something that would be quite so devastating, you know, end on, on elephants that were alive and whole and complete and had their tusks and, and also the idea of extinction and just creating a structure that would be um, unusual and kind of captivating. So it was really pretty much that. Yes. Um, I have two questions. I, I've actually been to China and walked markets in Beijing and Xi'an and actually seen the, the ivory art and crafts. Um, I'm just uh, the first question is: uh, Could you talk about how um, like a transnational issue like this? How do you really get governments on board? And and so is the selling point really going to be the terrorism? Um, so that, that's the first question. And then the second question is for Catherine. Uh, I know you've never done animation before. 